Welcome to the Education and Labor Cabinet's Warehousing National Emphasis Program webinar. Please take a moment to read this disclaimer. The objectives of this webinar are to outline the focus and reason for this National Emphasis Program, also known as an NEP, to identify common hazards associated with the warehousing and distribution industries, and to provide possible solutions and controls to these hazards. This NEP is intended to reduce or eliminate hazards and improve worker safety in the warehousing and distribution center industry. Over the last 10 years, the warehousing and distribution center industry has experienced a surge in employment. During the same time period, the injury and illness rates associated with the warehousing industries has been significantly higher than the baseline private general industry rate. From 2011 to 2021, employment in the warehousing and distribution industry jumped from just under 669,000 employees in 2011 to over 1.7 million total employees in 2021. The five-year injury rate from 2017 to 2021 was significantly higher in the warehousing industry when compared with the baseline for all of private industry. This table compares both the total recordable cases and the days away restricted and transferred or DART rate of all private industry to different types of warehousing and distribution industries over the five-year period from 2017 to 2021. This table shows the most frequently cited federal standards in the warehousing industry. First is obstructed exit routes, followed by general duty clause citations for things like racking systems, not using seat belts while operating forklifts, and heat and ergonomic hazards. Next is forklift training and evaluation and forklift certification. Then developing and implementing a hazard communication program and training employees on hazardous chemicals, reevaluating forklift operators performance every three years and having eyewash facilities when using corrosive chemicals, securely storing materials, and finally properly reporting injuries and illnesses to OSHA. Warehousing and distribution center operations pose a variety of serious safety and health hazards. These may include ergonomic hazards, powered industrial trucks, material handling equipment, struck by and caught in between hazards, slips, trips, and falls, the use of chemicals, means of egress, and heat and cold hazards. Ergonomics, the science of fitting jobs to people, helps lessen muscle fatigue, increases productivity, and reduces the number and severity of work-related musculoskeletal disorders. Warehouse and industry workers may be exposed to ergonomic risk factors in the workplace, such as lifting and lowering heavy items and reaching overhead, bending, performing the same or similar tasks repetitively, vibrations, working in awkward body postures, static positions, and forceful exertions like pushing and pulling heavy loads. Exposure to these known risk factors increases workers' risk of musculoskeletal disorders, or MSDs, such as muscle strains, lower back and shoulder injuries, carpal tunnel syndrome, tendinitis, and others. Stress and fatigue associated with a fast work pace can exacerbate MSDs. To eliminate or reduce the chance of injury, some ergonomic risk factors can be addressed through engineering solutions. Physical changes to the workplace to eliminate or reduce the hazard associated with the task may include use of a device to lift and reposition heavy objects, reducing the weight of a load, use of diverging conveyors off a main line so that tasks are less repetitive, installing diverters on conveyors to direct materials towards the worker to eliminate excessive leaning or reaching, and routine maintenance of powered industrial trucks to reduce vibrations from the vehicle. Ergonomic risk factors can also be addressed through administrative or work practice controls. These types of controls help establish more efficient work processes or procedures. These include alternating heavy tasks with light tasks, providing a variety of tasks to eliminate repetition, providing short rest breaks to allow recovery time, and rotating workers through jobs that use different muscles, body parts, or postures. This diagram provides some helpful tips on lifting do's and don'ts. When lifting heavy loads, employees should do team lifts instead of trying to lift bulky loads alone. 
When placing a load, turn with your legs and avoid twisting to lower the risk of a back injury. Lift loads from the ground using your legs instead of your back and use equipment when you can to move heavy loads instead of carrying them. One of the most dangerous hazards in a warehouse is the improper use of power industrial trucks. These are commonly called forklifts. Incidents involving forklifts have included employee killed when forklift pins him against tank, driver killed when forklift he was steering tipped over, secretary and treasurer killed when she is crushed by a forklift being jump started, and truck driver crushed by a forklift. Powered industrial trucks, or PIT operators, need to be properly trained to understand each PIT they will be using and the working environment they will be using the PIT in. Proper training helps prevent injuries to operators and pedestrians, and it helps prevent damage to equipment in the warehouse. Each PIT training program must consist of three parts. Formal instruction, this includes background information about the forklift and its safe operation. This is typically done in a classroom or online setting. Second, practical training. This should involve hands-on demonstrations and practical training on the forklift using a training course. And finally, evaluation. This is an evaluation of the forklift operator's performance using the truck in the actual work environment. At least every three years, forklift operators should be reevaluated on their performance using the vehicle in the work environment. Only trained and certified workers are allowed to operate a powered industrial truck in the work environment. Before a forklift operator begins using a vehicle, they need to examine the whole vehicle for any hazardous conditions that might make it unsafe for use. Forklift operators should always wear a seatbelt if it is available. Never exceed the rate of load on a forklift and ensure the load is stable and balanced. The operator should ensure they have enough clearance when raising, loading, and operating the vehicle and always follow safe procedures for picking up, putting down, and stacking loads. Operators should always be on the lookout for pedestrians and observe the speed limit in the work environment. Forklift operators should slow down in congested areas and areas that may have slippery surfaces. Use horns at cross aisles in areas that have obstructive views. Never give rides or use the forks to lift people. If you're required to park a vehicle on an uneven surface, you should set the emergency brake and always ensure that backup alarms are in working condition before operating a forklift. Some best practices for operating a power industrial forklift include add pedestrian lanes to warehouses, protect storage racks by using barricades and guards, install approach warning lights on the front and back of forklifts, and only operate a PIT at a speed that will allow the truck to be stopped safely. Dock boards should be designed, constructed, and maintained to prevent vehicles from running off the dock board's edge. Keep a safe distance from platform, ramp, and loading dock edges. Never back a PIT up to the dock's edge. Ensure dock boards are anchored to prevent them from moving out of a safe position. Block off open loading dock doors that could be a fall hazard and use fall protection on loading docks where employees would be exposed to an unprotected edge that is four feet or higher. Use wheel chocks or dock locks to prevent trucks or trailers from moving while being loaded. Safe storage and handling of material in warehouses is critical to preventing worker injury and property damage. Improper storage and handling can cause musculoskeletal disorders, body parts caught and machinery are the potential for collapsing storage racks. Racking should frequently be inspected and maintained to prevent it from collapsing. Upright guards should be installed on racks to prevent incidental damage or forklift contact. Ensure that materials stored on racks and shelving do not create a hazard or have the potential to fall in employees below. Bags, containers, and bundles should be stored in tiers that are stacked, blocked, interlocked, and limited in height. Loose materials should be properly stacked to prevent them from falling off racking. Keep storage areas free of materials that could potentially lead to tripping, fire, or explosions, and pest harborage. Heavy loads should be placed on lower or middle shelves, and storage shelving and rack load capacity should not be exceeded. Post the rated weight limits on racks to help ensure weight limits are followed. For mechanical equipment that is used to handle materials, 
pallet jacks and forklifts should receive periodic maintenance. Ensure that there is enough clearance when moving equipment through aisles, through doorways, at loading docks, and when making turns. Aisles and passageways should be kept clean and unobstructed, and floors should be well maintained and repaired if damaged. When using conveyors, make employees aware that rotating parts can pull in or crush body parts. Items can also be ejected from or fall off of a conveyor, which may be hazardous. Conveyors should be inspected regularly. When inspecting conveyors, ensure that pinch points are adequately guarded. Develop procedures for locking out and de-energizing conveyors for when maintenance is needed or jams need to be cleared. In the area around a conveyor, proper lighting should be provided and the working surface should be well maintained. Warehouse operations need a lockout tagout program to ensure that workers are protected when servicing or doing maintenance on a machine. Workers may be seriously injured if hazardous energy is not properly controlled while servicing equipment. Injuries resulting from the failure to control hazardous energy during maintenance activities can be serious or fatal and may include electrocution, burns, crushing, cutting, lacerating, amputating, or fracturing body parts. Employers should develop a lockout tagout program and train their employees on this program. Anytime maintenance is done on a machine that could harm employees, lockout tagout procedures must be followed. Automated tools and robotics used in warehouses can be hazardous if not integrated properly. When robotics are used in warehouses, workers should be made aware of the unique hazards they may pose, such as a potential for struck by and caught between hazards. Robotics that are commonly used in warehousing may include automated mobile robots, robotic pickers and sorters, and automated packaging systems. To help control these hazards, install controls such as light sensors, pressure plates, barriers, and e-stops. Slips, trips, and falls in the workplace remain some of the most prominent causes of occupational injuries. Warehouses can present a unique set of challenges because they are a constantly changing environment with products constantly being loaded, unloaded, and moved around the warehouse. These types of hazards include falls to lower levels, clutter left on floors, and wet or slippery floors. Employers need to understand the legal requirements and best practices for preventing slips, trips, and falls. Employers should ensure that each worker on a surface with an unprotected side or edge that is four feet or more above a lower level is protected from falling to the lower level. Provide workers with and ensure they use head protection if they are being exposed to the potential for objects to fall on them from above. And keep floors clear of clutter and maintain housekeeping. Where chemicals are present in a warehouse and workers may be exposed to those chemicals under normal conditions or in a foreseeable emergency, employers are subject to OSHA's hazard communication standard. Employees have a right to know what chemicals are in the workplace and what the hazards associated with those chemicals are. Employers need to develop a hazard communication program and maintain a list of all known chemicals that are in the workplace and keep safety data sheets for each chemical. Safety data sheets must be readily accessible to employees. Labels on chemical containers must be kept intact and workers should be trained to protect themselves from hazardous chemicals and what procedures they should follow if they are exposed to chemicals. OSHA's Process Safety Management, or PSM standard, applies to warehousing facilities that have certain highly hazardous chemicals at or above specific quantities and is the overall management of these chemical hazards. The types of businesses that would be required to follow the PSM standard might include warehouses that use ammonia refrigeration systems that contain 10,000 or more pounds of anhydrous ammonia or warehouses that store 10,000 pounds or more of flammables in one location. Unexpected releases of toxic, reactive, or flammable liquids and gases in storage facilities with highly hazardous chemicals have been reported for years. These releases can affect not only your own business, but neighboring businesses and your community as well. The PSM system integrates technologies, procedures, and management practices that are all needed to reduce hazards. Implement the required OSH programs to help prevent fires, explosions, large chemical spills, toxic gas releases, runaway chemical reactions, and other major incidents. This will protect employees, 
contractors, visitors, and emergency responders. This will also minimize damage to facility equipment and neighboring structures. Emergencies and disasters can strike at any time, so it's important that employers develop an emergency action plan to prepare workers for potential emergencies. These emergencies may include fires, severe weather events, and workplace violence. Your emergency action plan, or EAP, should at minimum contain the following elements. Procedures for reporting a fire or other emergency. Procedures for evacuation. Procedures for employees who remain to operate critical plant operations. Procedures to account for all employees. Procedures to be followed by employees performing rescue or medical duties. And the name or job title of every employee who may be contacted by other employees for more information about the plan. For emergency exits and exit routes, ensure the safeguards that are designed to protect employees are in working order at all times. These include things like sprinkler systems, alarm systems, fire doors, and emergency lighting. Ensure exit signs are clearly visible and keep exit routes unobstructed and exit doors unlocked from the inside during working hours. Ensure exit routes are adequately lit. Warehouses often contain many different types of electrical equipment and systems, and employers are responsible for ensuring they are free from recognized hazards. Always install electrical equipment in accordance with the instructions from the manufacturer. Use cord sets and extension cords that have a ground wire. Do not use the area around electrical panels or shutoffs for storage, and make sure this equipment is always unblocked and accessible. Guard live parts of electrical equipment at all times. All electrical equipment should be visually inspected before it is used. Properly close unused openings in cabinets, boxes, and fittings. Flexible cords and cables such as extension cords should not be used as a substitute for fixed wiring and should only be used temporarily. Extension cords should never be attached to building surfaces by zip ties, tape, or other means. They should not run through walls, ceilings, doorways, or windows. And you should ensure that cords are connected to devices and fittings in a way that strain relief is provided. Heat illness can affect warehousing workers performing physical work in high ambient heat, especially if the facility is also humid and not climate controlled. Allow new or returning workers to gradually increase workloads and take more frequent breaks as they acclimatize or build up a tolerance to the heat. Have a wet bulb globe thermometer on site to know what the heat index in your facility is. Air temperatures in the 80s with high humidity and strenuous workloads have caused heat stress and even worker fatalities. Provide workers with drinking water, rest breaks, and cool shaded areas, and ensure that warehouses are well ventilated. Train workers on heat-related illnesses and how to recognize their onset. Employers should monitor workers for signs of illness and ensure employees have access to first aid and prompt medical attention. Wet bulb globe thermometers differ from typical thermometers because they take into account the air temperature, humidity, radiant heat, and air movement. This creates a more accurate measure of the environmental heat impact on body temperature. This table shows the risk of heat-related illnesses on both unacclimatized workers and acclimatized workers at different wet bulb globe temperature ranges. At ranges below 70 degrees, unacclimatized and acclimatized workers are at low risk of heat-related illnesses. At temperature ranges between 70 and 77 degrees, unacclimatized workers are at risk when doing strenuous work, while acclimatized workers are still at low risk. At temperatures above 77 degrees, unacclimatized workers are at high risk of heat-related illnesses while doing strenuous work. And strenuous work for acclimatized workers becomes possibly unsafe in this range. Employees who work in cold conditions may be at risk of cold stress. This especially includes workers in refrigerated or unheated warehouses. Workers should be trained on cold stress hazards and prevention. Employers should provide workers with protective clothing if working in cold environments. Keep doors to cold storage unlocked or provide an inside release to allow workers to exit. And provide workers with regular breaks in warm, dry areas. 
Cold body parts are at a higher risk of sprains, strains, and other musculoskeletal disorders, especially back, shoulders, and wrist. Workplace stress and fatigue can increase worker injury rates and produce negative health effects. Warehousing employers should provide workers with opportunities to provide input on staffing issues, arrange schedules to allow for rest breaks and nighttime sleep, adjust the work environment to increase alertness, educate and train workers on workplace stress and fatigue and their associated health impacts, and consider implementing a fatigue risk management plan. This brings us to the end of this webinar on warehousing and distribution centers. In this webinar, we covered what the National Emphasis Program is and its reason and focus. We talked about the common hazards that are found in the warehousing industry and went over some potential controls that could be implemented to address these hazards. A PDF containing helpful links that have more in-depth information about some of the topics covered has been posted alongside this webinar on KY Safe. For more free online learning opportunities that cover these topics and more, please see our website. Thank you for watching this training.